Uh, number one, I mean, most people say viola, and it's really viola, like the musical instrument. My friends um, have been down to the Miami Museum to see Bill's piece when it was being shown there, and I could tell when they walked out that they were a little confused. And I think sometimes they're looking for someone to explain what they've seen. And you really can't do that. So what I say to them, I said, Bill's kind of art combines video and audio and computers and it is it it comes from his brain what he sees and there is no real explanation for it you have to say yourself what you've seen and so that's the way i, I try to explain it to my friends I, I'm, I'm not sure whether I've convinced them. I'm not sure whether I convinced them. No, that's not gonna work. Oh, I know what'll work. That's still where I think it is. Okay, now. There was no time really that I could really barely remember that I, I wasn't involved with images and with, with making things and with visualizing and, and things. And it just, you know, I've been doing it all my life in a way. I happened to grow up in the electronic age. When I first touched this medium, it was like an old friend. It was just something very familiar. When you take the lens cap off, you're looking at the real world, a particular view of something. The drop falls, and it projects onto this uh, video projection in the back of the, of the space, and it's huge, with a, with a drum on the floor with a microphone under it, and it hits the drum, and <laughs> Yeah. Something clicks inside of me. There's something that won't let me go. It could be the dumbest little thing. It could be like, like uh, a thought of a, an image of an old man sleeping, you know? Or that just pops into my head. Or uh, uh, oftentimes it's a fragment of something I've read. I find that particularly for me specifically, personally, to be very evocative. The one who travels, the one who speaks, the one who enlightens, the one who boasts. Sound has been such an essential the part of my work. Yes. Um, people think of my work on visual terms, and we call the area the of my uh, occupation visual art. But in fact, I think sound has been really essential for me. It's a substance in the ground of the image. The one who squeezes, the one who shifts, the one who shuts. The one who stabilizes, the one who disables. The artwork I do falls into two basic areas. I make videotapes, and then I make video installations, which are room environments that incorporate video images, sound, and sometimes other objects. A good example of an installation piece would be uh, Room for St. John of the Cross, a piece I did based on the life of the Spanish poet and mystic. The whole room 
is the work and it's meant to be experienced by the viewer in its entirety. When you work with videotape, you're working with time and image. But when you make an installation, you're working with time as well as real space. I've always felt that what I was given this vision when I was younger that I feel very lucky to have been given so clearly and I'll probably be spending the rest of my life kind of exploring it. You know, if I have to go and wait, watch the light change on a mountain for a week to get one shot, I'll do it. It's what this work demands, what that idea demands. Over the years when we've been working together, um, I have taken a lot of photographs um, of where we are and of course of Bill. Bill's process has to do with searching for something that uh, is out there in landscape. Um, I mean, it's the world that we live in basically. One of his themes throughout his work in general has been um, the individual in the world. For him, it's totally intuitive, collecting the images almost as, as if you were collecting a, a, a vocabulary for that work or writing a poem. And it took a long, long time for him to be able to relax enough and to just feel that I was part of the furniture or part of the landscape, if you want, um, for him to be comfortable with having somebody else there. Um, and for me, uh, there were some wonderful things about it and there were some things that weren't so wonderful, you know, like what is this guy doing and when is he going to tell me what we're doing here <laughs> and um, are we going to turn the camera on <laughs> and um, can I please have a set of headphones so that I can actually hear the audio instead of just standing there turning the machine on and off. A number of number of different cameras and uh, different things I use in my work, um, and I'll show them some of them to you. This is a, a fireproof housing for a camera. It uh, is relatively fireproof. You can't keep the camera in the flames for too long. This is uh, an early underwater housing that we made. It's a very simple kind of thing. Um, camera goes inside here and it has this high-tech lens cap on from the top of a thermos <laughs> jar and uh, this you know allows me to move the camera underwater with a, a fair amount of uh, flexibility this was designed for uh, shooting in moonlight um, and it has an image intensifier in it and uh, with it I was able to shoot a lot of the images from uh, the passing um, which were uh, recordings of the desert landscape at, in the middle of the night three o'clock in the morning uh, just with the light of the moon When I was doing this work with fire here, uh, a process happened to me that has happened to me quite often throughout my life and has actually become in some ways not only a process of working but the subject matter. And that is this moment 
of transformation, of change. If you look at something, in this case, through a telephoto eye of a camera, it just changes your perception of this very common sort of thing that happens every night on this beach where people are making fire. I think all of the work I've been doing is about that moment of change where you're looking at one thing, you're experiencing one thing, and something just turns over and it becomes something else. And, but at the same time, it's you that changes. The thing remains the same. That's really important. And then she's going to go through and she's going to pull out all the green ones. and That's going to be her budget. I know that. Plus our cost to fabricate and manage the thing and all that other stuff. So Today, the complexity green, of my work requires a team. It doesn't need to be noted here for the sunny requests. That Claire and Russ manage the studio I production. Guess, I guess it's maybe premature to go into all of this at this point. Yeah, until... I agree. Tom, who I've been working with for 10 years, he's the technical wizard that puts everything together and makes all this stuff possible. If we're going to put it on CD, there's going to be some work involved. I was working in my studio one day, and the uh, director of the Arizona State University Art Museum, Marilyn Zeidlin, she called me up. And she said, hey, you know, I got invited to submit uh, an idea for the Venice Biennial next year. I said, oh, really? She said, well, I'd like to do a show with you. The Venice Biennial is a hundred-year-old institution, sort of like a World's Fair for art which attempts to bring together the best and most representative work by uh, 43 countries. 275 curators around the country submit ideas for an exhibition, which whittled down to four or a handful of finalists, and they get selected by a national advisory committee. You know, it was amazing. Marilyn called me and said, we got it. And I, I thought, two things. I thought, oh, that's fantastic. And the other thing I thought was, oh my god, now I have to do it. <laughs> I have to make these things. This is the beginning of the uh, project. The first part of the creative process for me is in the form of writing with a few pictures here and there, but it's actually words describing situations or it could be quotes from different things I've been reading. The greeting was triggered directly by an encounter with a classical artist by the name of 